A number of times I have seen things on television and in movies that have irritated me quite a bit in a somewhat technical way. Other times, these errors have amused me. For example, in the beginning of Star Trek VI, Sulu has that table in front of his chair with a cup of tea on it. Then Excelsior begins to feel the effects of the energy wave and the cup starts to rattle. We see the cup rattle all the way over to one end of the table, then the camera changes angle and suddenly the cup is way over at the opposite edge, rattling the same direction. In the same movie, we learn that Klingon blood is pink, but in an episode of TNG which came out sooner, Worf participates in a Klingon ceremony to restore his family honor, and in the course of the ceremony he takes hold of the blade of a, uh, of a type of Klingon knife, which I believe is called a Duktag, and slides his hand down it, coating it with his blood. The blood he leaves behind is red. There is an episode of DS9, I don't remember which, in which Quark meets up with an old Cardassian flame, and in one scene he walks in and she has a Cardassian disruptor trained on him. In the course of the scene, he gets hit with a stun blast and collapses on the deck, unconscious. The thing is, when he first walks in, he's in a Ferengi business suit, with a jacket held together in front with some kind of clip. But the top part of the clip is not fastened and is hanging off to the side. When he gets hit by the blast, the last shot of the scene is of him lying unconscious on the deck, with the clip still hanging off to the side, then they fade to commercial, and when they come back from, the com from commercial, he's still lying there, but somehow the clip has righted itself. Back in the days when Paramount was still producing new episodes, I once came across the joke that one thing heard every day in the Paramount Studios was, well, so what if it contradicts something from back in the first season? No one's gonna notice! Dark Knight rocked as a movie, and Batman Begins was pretty good as well, but there was one thing about that movie that gnawed at me the whole time. Here we have Raz al Ghul and his band presuming to say that Gotham City has grown too decadent and corrupt to be allowed to survive. Bruce Wayne disagrees, and insists that it hasn't yet reached that point. What's he implying? That it might one day? Who gets to decide how decadent and corrupt is too great an extent to, to be allowed to survive? What the hell gave Raz and his band the right to be judge, jury, and executioner? I sat there for practically the entire movie wondering when Bruce Wayne was going to ask this question. Back to the Future, one detail I could never understand was the whole disrupted causation. I mean, if Marty travels back in time and inadvertently prevents his parents from meeting, they won't have him, which means he won't be able to travel back in time to prevent them from meeting, which means they will have him, which means... you get the idea. The time machine, I thought, handled this much better. Our hero sees the woman he loves die, and in his grief he realizes that it would have been a simple matter to prevent her death if he had only known in advance how it would happen. Now that he does know, he sets out to figure out how to travel back in time to just before her death to prevent it. But, much to his shock, she simply dies a different way. But then, of course, he realizes that he could have prevented this death as well, if he had known in advance how, how it would happen. So he tries again. But yet again, he manages to steer her out of one death into another. He tries over and over again, but each time he manages only to change the circumstances of her death. He can never seem to actually prevent it. Eventually, we find out that her death here is necessary, since it is her death which pushes him to figure out time travel. If she doesn't die, he won't be, be driven to figure out time travel, which means she will die. Since her death caused his time travel, his time travel cannot prevent her death. That's what's happening there. If A caused B, then B cannot prevent A. I wonder, though, what if he had first found his counterpart from the same time period, and shown him all the discoveries about time travel to ensure that the proverbial code would still be cracked, then advise his counterpart from the past of the importance of traveling back to this date both to pass on this information and to prevent the death of his beloved. Back in the day, I was a fan of a TV show called The Outer Limits, the 90s version. Most of its episodes I found quite entertaining and profound, but there was one that really pissed me off. It's not often that I'm compelled to talk to the television, but I was this time. You see, the plot for one particular episode was profoundly moronic in its handling of the same phenomenon. A guy figured out how to travel in time, traveled a couple days into the future, and was excited about his tremendous breakthrough. So naturally, he went home to tell his wife. When he arrived, he found her lying on the floor, dead, from a gunshot wound. No crime scene tape, no talk outline, no law enforcement personnel anywhere in sight, and no animals feeding on the corpse, so you can tell this must have been fairly recent. This happened within the last couple hours. So the guy sets about trying to prevent her death. He goes back to his lab, and 
travels back to the time he came from and tells her. Well, apparently, things have not been going well for this couple recently, and he is one of the first people she suspects. How is that for foreshadowing? Now, it seems to me the most prudent and effective thing they could have done to prevent this was simply to arrange to have her stay with a friend on the other end of town during this time when the shooting was supposed to happen. That would ensure that she wasn't there at the time. And if she's concerned that the perpetrator might in fact have been him, then the place she stays should be a place he doesn't know about. And if he truly cares for her well-being, then he should have no objection to that. But instead, a couple days later, the tension between them has reached such a point that he ends up being carted away by the police. But of course he can't leave quietly because he's trying to prevent her from being shot, which is supposed to happen in the next few hours. So after the police cruiser has gone a few blocks, he gets away from them, takes one of their guns, shoots and kills both officers, and runs back to the house, where, surprise, surprise, he ends up shooting and killing his wife. Now, it was clear to me watching this that the best thing for him to do at this point would be to simply park it and await the arrival of his counterpart from the past. After all, the whole reason he couldn't prevent this was that he simply hadn't known how it would happen. This was the point at which I started talking to the television, and this is what I was explaining, as if under the impression that I stood any chance of actually having someone hear it. He ended up causing this by trying to prevent it. Therefore, to successfully prevent it, all, could, all, all he would have to do would be nothing at all. If he explains this to his counterpart from the past, that counterpart will return to the past and take no action. Though perhaps it would be prudent to take action to ensure that this information continues to be passed back. But what does he do instead? He goes back to his lab, uses his time machine again, and travels all the way back to before they met. Here she is at a club of some sort, sitting in the corner, alone, looking like her world just came crashing down around her. He sees her through the window and recognizes that this is the night they meet. So he goes a few blocks, confronts his counterpart from that time period, shoots him, and kills him. At this point, I find myself wondering if this clown would respond to an itch on his arm by shooting it. Of course, with his past counterpart dead, he vanishes. And then they take us back to the club just in time to see this ashen-faced woman receive a drink that apparently she has ordered, and after the server walks away, she pulls out a bottle of pills. The notion that this continuous train of cognitive bungling and its tragic conclusion somehow amounted to a, pr to a profound point left me pretty much disgusted. But I was much more disgusted recently when I checked out the first season of the same show from the library. A couple episodes were really good, but the first was nothing but a continuous scare tactic and there was this theme weaving its way through virtually every other episode which boiled down to the same false dichotomy. Science is, like, powerful stuff, right? Yeah. Well, so that means, like, scientists are powerful people, right? I guess. Well, what if one of them scientists just, like, started doing really dumb stuff? And then kept on doing really dumb stuff? And kept on and on until disaster happened? That'd be terrible. Yeah. Let's make an episode about it. Over and over again, weird things begin to happen, and there are two reactions. There are those who spontaneously accept the first extraordinary explanation that happens along, and those who spontaneously dismiss it. And of course, those who dismiss it are consistently painted as total jackasses. Look at the message here. If you don't automatically accept extraordinary claims, you're a jackass who places the world in danger. But spontaneous acceptance of any claims when is given is not open-mindedness. It's gullibility. Open-mindedness is the willingness to consider something, but there's no reason why consideration can't entail skeptical scrutiny.